Okay, so Jill Stark, thanks so much for taking the time to have a chat with us. Um, Jill, we've had a quite a great history. I mean, you you were the journalist that really, when you're working at the age that shared Hello Sunday Morning in its infancy, would have been what seven, eight years ago, something like that. 2011, it's nine it's years ago. Nine years ago. Actually, was it? No, it was, yes, it was 2011 when I wrote that first piece. No, when I first interviewed you, it was 2010, and you said to me, you should try giving up alcohol, and I was like, I don't think so, and then <laughs> in 2011, I did give up alcohol, and I wrote that piece, and I think you had like maybe 50 or so bloggers on the site at the time, and then I think that night that that high sobriety article was published, your servers kind of melted down. Yeah. <laughs> it was a, been an amazing story. And I mean, you took that and then took that experience and then turned that into a book uh, and it just a, sort of shot you off into this new career into writing and, and in a particular way of writing, which is kind of writing with self-reflection, which is very different to the journalism you were doing before and kind of put you into this place where now your kind of role and work is focused around a lot of mental health and advocacy and trying to improve both the system at large, but also practical ways that people can change their life as well. Um, and so I wanted to talk to you today because a lot of our members are going through this challenge that we're all facing. and are themselves really confronted with some of the kind of scarier parts of being anxious and they're dealing with their anxiety. And you've spoken and researched quite extensively in this area, so I thought it'd be great to talk to you, um, but also just check in um, with you as a kind of bit of a history about your experience um, with alcohol and your relationship with alcohol and how it's changed. So um, maybe we could start there, you know, before the before high sobriety came out, what was your relationship with alcohol like? Oh, it's pretty tumultuous. I think when I met you, uh, I, I think there was obviously a part of me unconsciously that was really wanting to change because I wrote the story about you and Hello Sunday Morning when it was very, very new. It was just you um, and it was in its infancy. And I think there was obviously part of me that was attracted to that idea of giving up drinking, but wasn't quite ready. Cause I remember you came to visit me at the, um, in the age newsroom and you said, Oh, you know, you should try giving up alcohol. And I said, um, sorry, I was turning this on to mute. Um, and I said, I don't think so. I'm a journalist. Like, like I could ever do that. Um, and, but I think, yeah, there was definitely a part of me that, that was, really keen to explore that and it was in 2011 um, January 1 that I woke up with the worst hangover I've ever had and I thought I was going to die and I was having panic attacks as I was driving the car to Macca's um, and I realized like your words had stayed in my head like you know if this if the thought of um, giving up drinking scares you so much then you could ask yourself why. And that morning, and I was, well, it was the afternoon really, um, as I lay in bed sort of feeling sorry for myself, I just thought, like the thought of you, you had also said that three months was the sort of minimum period you felt was helpful in terms of um, changing behavior. And I thought three months, like I can't do that. It's summer, I've got my birthday in March. How is this gonna work? Um, and so yeah, lying there and I just thought, the thought of not drinking for three months scared the shit out of me. And that's when I knew that I had to do it because what, what kind of role was alcohol playing in my life that the thought of not drinking was some sort of social death. Um, and so I did, I, I decided to start my Hello Sunday morning journey and I started writing a blog. I've never written a blog before. And I, and I, I mostly the blog for me was about um, holding myself accountable. Um, so I would write how I was feeling and share it on Facebook and I was just getting like this incredible response from people like saying, wow, that's like really brave and all of those things, which I'm sure you've heard before, Chris. And um, at the end of the three months, I decided that I was going to keep going because I was really enjoying the way I was feeling mentally, physically, everything in life was just a bit more in balance and a bit more manageable. 
um, so I decided to, to do another three months. At the end of the first three months, so it would have been the end of March, beginning of April 2011, I said to my editor at the Sunday Age, um, I think, actually she suggested, why don't you write a piece about what you've learned over the last three months? So I did. So I wrote this piece. It was two and a half thousand words long in the old days of the broadsheet newspaper. So massive, two pages. Um, you know, it's a full, full broadsheet, broadsheet page and they used the headline high sobriety on it. And I, there was a picture of me dancing like a maniac at the primal screen gig, which everyone thought I was really drunk in, but I was actually completely sober in. And in that article, you know, I was a health reporter. I was a health reporter for the age and I was writing about alcohol a lot. Like that's what I was, I was winning awards for writing about Australia's binge drinking culture. So that's how I started the piece. I basically said, uh, it was a confessional and I said, um, you know, I'm the binge drinking health reporter. During the week, I write about Australia's alcohol problem. At the weekends, I write myself off. And that's how it began. And the whole thing was just very much me confessing about how I'd been a big drinker since I had my first drink at 13 growing up in Scotland, you know, a, a country where uh, teetotalism is a crime punishable by death. Uh, so yeah, we definitely, um, I talked about that. I talked about what it was like being a journalist, what it was like to, to, to go sober and suddenly feel like you were the odd one out and all of the sort of social uh, challenges that come when you first stop drinking. And I, like, I just, I remember walking out of the newsroom that night um, and um, my boss saying to me as I was walking out, so they had the pages laid out and they said, my boss said to me as I was leaving, Starkers, which was my nickname, um, enjoy your last night of anonymity, you know, and, and they were like, I can't believe you're doing this. And I was like, what have I done? And then the next day, I was just, I, I, I've been a journalist for 10 years at that point, and I'd never, I'd never written anything that had had that response. It was just crazy. Like people commenting, saying this was my story. It really resonated with me. I think you guys had, had because I mentioned Hello Sunday Morning in it, you guys had this huge spike in traffic, which was like just, I, and I was looking at the Hello Sunday Morning page and looking at the comments on the age story and just in tears going, wow, like that's the power of storytelling and, and sharing your experience, I guess. So from there, um, everything changed. You and I ended up on the Carrie Ann show, which was, <laughs> was an interesting, uh, interesting, yeah. I don't know, maybe you can tell them a bit about that, about Carrie Ann. Do you remember? It was uncomfortable, wasn't it? It, was the, it wasn't the greatest piece of journalism, but <laughs> I think it's a fun... I reckon, so, yeah, so just for those who may not have watched it, like go on YouTube, Jill Stark and Hello Sunday Morning, and, um, and sorry, and Carrie Ann generally and see what comes up. I actually <laughs> talk about that in, in the book. But anyway, so it led to um, TV appearances and it led to, I think, um, great things for Hello Sunday Morning, but it also led uh, me to a book deal, which was completely unexpected. I had two publishers come forward because in that piece, I talked about how giving up drinking had allowed me to go back to the, the novel that I'd always been working on and I was you know, wanting to write a book. And, um, and I, yeah, the publisher came forward and said, come and have a meeting. And they decided to not go down the novel path, but we'll do, we think that if you were to write, if you were to continue this experiment for a year and write a book about it, that would be an amazing book. And I was like, wow, like, this is a dream come true. Ever since I was a tiny girl in Scotland, I wanted to write books. And here was me being offered a book deal on the spot, like literally on the spot. Here's a deal, you know, it's not we're going to pay you. And I remember walking out of that publisher's office in Melbourne and walking to the street. It was a beautiful day and calling my best friend and just being like, let's go to the pub and then realizing that I couldn't because I just signed a contract. To all this, <laughs> a contract to so, so yeah, that led to, um, to high sobriety, which was to my great surprise, a, a bestseller. And still to this day, seven years on, people are still buying that book and, and talking about it. Cause I guess what it was, was my experience was, was universal. Like so many of us feel the same. And I think and around about that time, you know, 10 years ago, uh, nine, ten years ago, really, you kind of started that conversation, Chris, and I think I sort of was part of of 
continuing that conversation. And um, yeah, now we have a whole genre of what they call quitlet, right? Like there's just all these books out there about quitting preaching. But I was the OG. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How, I mean, um, I want to sort of dig into that comment that your editor said, you know, enjoy your last night of anonymity. Um, I know, um, you know, when you come out publicly as, as, as talking about something that's, you know, taking a different lifestyle choice, whatever it is, um, that it does come with a certain level of pressure on uh, whether that's self-imposed or externally imposed. Um, as a result of doing that, you're no longer, you know, behind the, the wall of being a journalist. You have a, you've said something about yourself. How have you uh, kind of reconciled that and dealt with that in, in your life as a result of doing it? Well, it's funny, isn't it? Because back then in um, 2011, I, um, yeah, as you say, I was used to being on the other side of it and asking the questions and, and telling other people's stories. And all of a sudden I was the story and that was a really unusual situation to be in. And interestingly, since then, I think I've done nothing but bear my soul to the Australian public. Um, I've written two other books, The Ties of Variety, both kind of one, you know, one's a, a mental health memoir and one's a sort of, sort of self-help mental health book. Um, and I, like, I have absolutely no regrets about that because I have nothing to be ashamed of about the stories that I'm sharing. And I think the reason that you sh your story was so powerful was because, you know, people, we don't change culture, we don't change behaviour by policy and legislation and finger wagging we change culture by storytelling and by empathy and connection and so i think what i've tried to do with my books is you know, look at look at my own story but then sort of widen it out to the broader community and say well where are the common threads and what are we all experiencing and i guess yeah that, that's that's what i've tried to do is maybe sometimes i'm oversharing i um and yeah, anyway, I digress. We can get back to that later. But yeah, talk, the the books and the sharing of my story is now something that is so <laughs> just part of my life that sometimes I take a step back and go, oh, I, you know, people, I'll be in a cafe and someone will be like, are you Jill Stark? And I'm like, how do they know me? And then I'm like, oh, that's <laughs> I'm constantly on Instagram, like sharing <laughs> the intimate details of my life. So yeah, I, I, but I, I think that's, for me particularly with, with mental health that's how people feel less alone when you talk about the very real and messy and complex feelings that we all have whether it's around alcohol whether it's around anxiety whether it's around you know um how we view ourselves as humans i think the more we share the more you look at each other um and realize that you're all kind of experiencing very similar things i i, I wrote a um a series last year for Beyond Blue um, called Am I Normal? Spoiler alert, I'm not, but <laughs> none of us are, and that's the point. Um, so yeah, and the whole point of that article, uh, that series of articles was about, you know, what is normal and all of these different anxieties that I have, um, whether it's, you know, health anxiety or anxiety around climate change or anxiety around, um, you know, just just general feelings of struggling to get out of bed some mornings, like these feelings that we have, if we share them and talk about them, people feel more connected and less alone. Mm. A lot of our members have this experience of, um, you know, and particularly if alcohol has had a huge role in their life um, and they've had a few bad experiences with it and, They've kind of bundled up drinking and a lot of these negative things in life. Um, mm -hmm. And then the expectation is that once they quit alcohol, all these other negative things will go away as well. Did you find that was true for you? And, and, and did, did you see anything that was left that you were like, oh, actually, this is also here? Well, so just as a kind of recap on my drinking journey, I want to call it that. So I stopped drinking in 2011 for a year and wrote a book about it. Um, and I, you know, as I said, I've been drinking since I was 13 and I was 35 at the time when I wrote that book or when the, um, yeah, when I wrote that book. And I didn't, I don't think I really examined, like I learned so much about myself during that year, but I don't think I really examined in great detail how much alcohol for me 
was used as um, an anesthetic, as a numbing agent for a lot of difficult emotions. And so I, I definitely, when I stopped drinking, so it was nearly 14 months in the end that I stopped drinking for, and I did go back to drinking uh, much to a lot of people's disappointment like so many people even to this day still contact me and say how do you drink now like so many people felt that their their story was aligned to mine and they wanted to know if I could go back to moderation and was that possible and, and you know like I decided to go back to drinking and for a while like moderation was possible and things were in balance and there was many you know for probably a few years where there was many more occasions where I would um, go to a social situation and choose not to drink whereas before that just wasn't an option I would just drink in in every in every circumstance and so I was much more of a mindful drinker I was much I drank far less than I used to because one of the things I realized after taking a year off is that your body like doesn't take as much for you to get the hangovers get a bit worse so um so I sort of plotted along for a few years and then in 2014 2015 um i had quite a um quite a serious breakdown which my psychologist has rebranded as a breakthrough because it really was one of those moments where you find out a lot about yourself um and that's that's the story i tell in happy never after about what happens when you get everything you've ever wanted which was me writing that best-selling first book and i was dating a footballer which is not the recipe for happiness don't do that just quietly um i had you know great friends and a beautiful home and a great job and like everything was perfect and then slowly things started to unravel and so i looked at what was driving that what was driving my anxiety what's driving our anxiety as a community um so i looked at all of those cultural things as well as my own story um and yeah so i was in the last sort of year and a half two years where i've started to think well what as i so recovered from that breakthrough um mental health sort of episode um what are the things that keep me well and what are the things that get in the way and i just could no longer ignore the correlation between my mood collapsing and me having big nights of drinking big weekends of drinking and I just realized that moderation was not something that I was very good at. Um, and so June of last year, I was like, well, you know, I'd been so well, like in my mental health was really good. But then if I looked at what was causing the dips, it was always drinking. I mean, it wasn't the only thing, of course, but it was certainly making it harder to cope with life, really. So I stopped drinking in June last year and I just had this, like, like six month run of really stable mental health, like more stable than I'd had in a long time. Cause I was often like kind of up and down and this was just much more less of a roller coaster. And so, yeah, it's been, it's been nine months now since I've had a drink and I tell you what, like not drinking during a pandemic, like it's bloody hard, but I know it's the right decision for me mm. um, because geez, life's tough enough at the moment, right? Without throwing, like my anxiety as I call my hangover and my anxiety hangovers throwing that into the mix so I'm I'm I've, I've lost sight of what your initial question was but <laughs> sorry no that and that really gets to it like when and now even in this time of great anxiety or imposed anxiety mm. when you feel that anxiety come rise up in the place in which you wouldn't historically perhaps go and have a drink what do you do now well i think i think about where that drink would take me and i think about it was never usually one drink and you know i, I live alone um so like I, Drinking on my own is not something I've done for a long time anyway. That was one of the rules I imposed on myself a long time ago. But like, I, I'm not going anywhere. No one's going anywhere, right? I'm not like I can go for a walk with a friend, but I can't, I can't go and ha like hang out. And so if, if, if I was going to start drinking now, it would be me drinking on, on my own. Although, you know, I do have, um, like I'm sure everyone is doing like hangouts with my friends, either on house party or FaceTime or whatever every night. And they're all having a drink because it's knockoff time. And, and I've sort of thought to myself like, well, why can't I have a drink? Bloody hell, it's a pandemic. Like if now, if like you can't drink in a pandemic, then fuck, when can you drink? Like, <laughs> I'm just like, well, 
it's, it's sort of like I tell myself it's a treat, yeah. but it's not, not for me because I know that it wouldn't stop at one. And then I would become like habituated to using alcohol as a way to sort of feel better. And I, like, as I said in high sobriety, and it still stands true to this day, um, we think that alcohol takes the edge off and, you know, maybe it does. Maybe that first glass of wine or the second glass of wine relaxes you a little bit and the, the racing thoughts in your head are not so um, loud, but yeah, it takes the edge off, but the next day the edges are sharper and they cut you deeper. And so that's what I I think about when I think, well, I could have a glass of wine. I think, well, no, because like, like, like everyone, my anxiety is really, hard to manage at the moment because a lot of the usual things that we have in, in place to, to support us, whether it be going to the gym or hanging out with friends, like all of those things are not available to us. So alcohol is just a very bad, um, for me personally, a very bad psychologist, a very bad helper, a very bad friend. Um, so what do I do when I feel crap? Like, well, I journal a lot. I do, I journal a lot about why am I feeling like what, what's, what's driving this need for a drink. And it often is that sense of deprivation or oh, well, everyone else is doing it. Why can't I? And so it's sort of like, well, if you see alcohol as a reward, then you're going to feel deprived. But if you think about the, the, the downsides to alcohol and like, well, would it be more rewarding to me to actually take care of myself and nurture myself with a bit of self-love and um you know I, I do eat a lot of chocolate i have to say like that is probably my um my crutch i'm like you know what like i gotta have something at this point so i'm okay with that but yeah i, I think it's it doesn't make you anxious no it doesn't it's a, it is a comfort but i think that it's I, I i think it's really difficult for people who are struggling with their relationship with alcohol right now, because not only are you dealing with the fact that, um, you know, alcohol is, is a very common coping method that everyone uses and you're just seeing constantly on social media, all these memes about, you know, the only way to survive a pandemic is to sort of get plastered and it's one o'clock at 2, two, uh, 2 p.m. or whatever. Um, and that's hard because it, it's sort of like a social license to, to throw all your, um usual coping methods out the window and just go for this quick fix so i don't know i really i do feel for people who are in that situation like i um i'm finding it tough not to drink but i know that i won't because i just know i, I just know where it will take me mm. i think that's a, a great insight to get to have you had an experience with in your reflections on your relationship with alcohol in those Subtler moments when you're like, oh, I really feel like drinking here. Has it tied back to your family or to experiences in the past where you've thought, okay, this is this is where I learned how to do this, or this is what this is an experience that has happened that makes me feel anxious in this particular way, or is it just something that's inexplicable and it's just how you're made up? I don't. I don't think it's really. I mean, my family. Um growing up in, in Edinburgh and Scotland, like they, both mum and dad love to drink and mum probably more than, than dad. And um, they, like the way of, their way of celebrating was to have parties and to drink a lot. There was always a lot of alcohol around in my house. And I, I learned very early on that alcohol was the gateway to fun and, and, and freedom and sort of, you know, that, that sense of, of silliness and letting go. And, you know, when your parents are sort of dancing around the lounge room, and losing their inhibitions and they're very childlike. And so for a child, that's like, that's playful and it's fun. Mm. Um, I think now, like my mom was here the beginning of the year visiting and she still enjoys a drink, but she's 74 and I she doesn't drink as much as she used to. And she, she always brings whiskey with her. She brings like really nice whiskey. Like you can only get in Scotland. She brings it for my friends who are, who love whiskey. And so we have whiskey tasting at my house and I don't, don't have it like I've never liked the taste of whiskey much to her disgust but um but I just have my non-alcoholic beer or my non-alcoholic wine and um and it just hasn't made any difference to our, our relationship so yeah I don't I don't think that I'm I'm seeking that kind of comfort when I'm looking to drink I, d I do think that I still feel a little bit like 
oh, everyone's having a drink. Like my friends, there's eight of us in a group chat and they're like, will text me or text us all like 4 p.m. cocktail hour and they're all sort of sending through the drinks that they're having at home. Um, and I'm like, well, what, what difference would it make to have a drink in my hand right now to be sitting in my apartment on my own having a drink on, on FaceTime when I can have my non-alcoholic beer? It's the same thing. It's the same sense of ritual, I guess. Mm -hmm. For me, one of the things that I think I would say to anyone who's like, well, I can't have fun anymore if I don't drink or how do I have that, that sense of playfulness? Like you've got to find new ways. And I sort of explore this in my second book in Happy Never After, like just the idea of, of play as a really essential um, part of human thriving. That we, when we we're kids, we kind of just like dance like no one's watching. We run at full tilt. Like we've just got this sense of abandon and sense of, of freedom and liberation. Um, and then we kind of grow up and we get crushed under the weight of adult responsibility and obligation and self-consciousness and oh, I might look stupid or I better not do that because I'm the CEO of a company and I can't like, you know, dance and all of this sort of stuff that is just social conditioning. And so like the, there's a bunch of very, very smart scientists in the world who look at the science of play. Um, and they, there's, there's one guy who says, you know, the opposite of um, play is depression like it really like we need we need to play to feel vibrant and alive and i think that's never been more important than right now when we are in this state of so sort of suspended animation where we just nothing seems normal and nothing seems like the ground beneath us is shaking is, is is shifting like to really tap into this child part of us is freaking out and say well what do you need and what what do you need to have fun so i used to um often but when we were allowed to spend a lot of time outdoors, I would, um, when I was quite unwell a few years ago, and I, I would used to walk as part of therapy um, because I couldn't face going to the gym, but I needed to do exercise. So I'd walk and do laps of the park. And I remember one day listening to, I think I was listening to Lady Gaga and, um, and I just felt like this part of me was like, I want to dance. And I was walking around this track and I was like, well, you can't dance in the middle of the day. There's people everywhere. And then I was like, no, I'm going to give myself permission. And so I just ran full tilt into the middle of this oval and just had this silent disco for one, because you know, who cares? Like, honestly, who gives a fuck what you look like? Like, let that part of you run free. And, you know, maybe you can't do that as much now. We're a bit more constrained. But what I've been doing every day at 5.30 I host a dance party for myself. I've got a disco light that I put on in my <laughs> and I, I and I have I just have this dance and I've put a few of them up on my Instagram because I just feel like you know we need a little bit of light relief at the moment. But just that sense of of course, like no one's underestimating how serious the situation is we're in. There's there's life and death sort of um, stakes for a lot of people. People are all losing their jobs. Me dancing in my lounge room doesn't undermine that. It just acknowledges that for us to be able to get through this, we all need to be able to have these moments of lightness and, and connection to ourselves and give ourselves permission to have fun in the middle of this. Because if we don't, it's going to be so much harder to cope with. It's a really beautiful message. Jill, thank you so much for sharing your experience and thoughts. And uh, I'm sure this is going to be really useful for our members who are going through this. And uh, hopefully we see more videos of dancing up there. I'm going to jump on there and <laughs> try and have a look at them now. <laughs> yeah, put one on this afternoon as well. So. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me. No worries. Thanks, Chris.